Hello and welcome to English Lessons with Lakshmi. Today, by way of introduction to the poem Andrea del Sarto by Robert Browning, I am going to begin with uh, a discussion on the poetic genre called dramatic monologue. Robert Browning was one of the three most popular poets of the Victorian age, the other two being Alfred Lord Tennyson and Matthew Arnold. The Victorian age was a highly turbulent age with a lot of changes happening all at the same time. The Victorian age was an age of great changes and within 50 years so much of change happened that the people were quite bewildered by what was happening around them. There was so much of scientific advancement and progress and uh, there arose a conflict between science and religion. And again, what with uh, Charles Darwin's evolution of man, uh, there was the very uh, foundations of religious faith were shaken. And so it was during this period and uh, that um, Robert Browning lived. And as we see in all ages, the writers and the thinking minds are always influenced by what happens around them. Similarly, the same happened with these poets too. But what is interesting about Robert Browning is that he kept himself aloof from the turmoils of the age. He of course had his own share of uh, spiritual conflicts as he was growing up. He was a rebel of sorts. But by the time he came uh, to become a writer, an established writer, he had come to terms with his religious conflicts and he had kind of settled down. And he decided that as long as God's there in heaven, God is there in heaven, all's well with the world. And with that, he stopped bothering too much about the changes that happened around him. And he found uh, a greater interest in dealing with individuals, individual men and women into whose minds he decided to delve deeper and deeper. And in this attempt, he revealed very interesting characters to us. And for this, interest of his, he understood that the best method suited would be the poetic genre called dramatic monologue. The dramatic monologue in the hands of a poet like Robert Browning enhanced itself to such perfection that nobody else was able to achieve the level of excellence that he had achieved. Uh, in his monologues, you see such brilliant characterization of very, very interesting people. Now let me uh, tell you more about this uh, dramatic monologue before we progress to the poem Andrea del Sarto. In a dramatic monologue, the speaker usually addresses an audience, uh, usually an imaginary audience or a silent listener who sits somewhere before him. And this speaker in a dramatic monologue is usually not the poet, but it is somebody else usually another individual, a very well-defined individual. And in the case of uh, Robert Browning, he chose um, real life individuals like Andrea, who was a painter of Florence or Fra Lipolipi. And so that is another characteristic feature of the dramatic monologue that the speaker is not the poet, but another individual. And uh, in almost all dramatic monologues, you see that there is a listener, a silent, passive listener. And the listener doesn't really um, talk to the speaker. There is no conversation going on between them. And that is why, uh, that is why it is called a monologue. There is no dialogue between the listener and the speaker. But interestingly, from what the speaker tells us, we do understand a lot about the silent and the, the passive listener. And um, this form uh, called dramatic monologue was used earlier by English poets like Dunn. And of course, you know, uh, a classic example again is uh, Marvel's To His Coy Mistress. And Tennyson too used this. And later on, poets like Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, and Robert Frost in American literature, they have all employed this beautifully. But I guess none of them could excel Robert Browning in his use of the genre. And 
A dramatic monologue is not to be mistaken for a soliloquy because a soliloquy is not intended for a listener. It is just an instance where a character or a speaker vents out his uh, personal feelings. So a listener is not intended there, an audience is not expected, but in a dr dramatic monologue there is always an audience to whom all this is said. And uh, so these are the basic characteristics of uh, characteristic features of a dramatic monologue and uh, I uh, chanced to come across a very interesting observation by a critic called Robert Langbaum who has written a book, I'll just read the name of the book here, The Poetry of Experience, The Dramatic Monologue in the Modern Literary Tradition. This was a book that was published in 1957 and in this book Robert Langbaum makes a very interesting observation of dramatic monologues in special, with special reference to Robert Browning's um, poems. And he says that what is interesting about dramatic monologues or uh, the peculiar genius of his, uh, the form is that, it creates, is that it creates a kind of a tension between sympathy and judgment. Okay, now what does he mean by that? Now in all good, uh, in all um, well crafted dramatic monologues, uh, according to Robert Langbaum, there is a disequilibrium between the validity of the speaker's apprehension of reality and objective validity. Now, let me try to um, explain this further, this idea of there being a tension between sympathy and judgment. So, for instance, when we read a poem like My Last Duchess, which most of you maybe would have come across, because it is commonly prescribed in uh, school and college classes. In, in, in this particular poem, which is a very interesting one, you have this duke who is talking to an ambassador from another country about his previous duchess. Now this uh, uh, ambassador has come there with a proposal from, from his country, a marriage proposal, and the duke is talking to him about his earlier wife, Oh, and uh, that is the Duchess. That's why the my my last Duchess. And he tells us uh, tells us, and of course he's talking to the ambassador. He's telling her, uh, telling I'm sorry, he's telling him uh, how he was so much in love with his wife of his, and she was such a wonderful and a very beautiful lady, and how she easily showered her affection on others. That she used to smile even at the gardener. He says, can you imagine that? She smiled even at the gardener and so what happened finally was that he was so possessive that he decided to kill her because he couldn't, couldn't stand the idea of his uh, beloved wife even smiling at others. And so he says, I put an end to her. So when you read this poem, two things happen. One, you empathize with this man. You understand his love for his wife. You understand his extreme possessiveness for her and you kind of feel that you can understand why he killed her. That is one side. But at the same time, you also stand in judgment of this person because you know that what he did was not right. His crime, the criminal inclination of his mind, the jealousy that he had, the possessiveness, all these which can be considered as negative traits are revealed too, quite unwittingly by the man himself. So the reader, at the same time, he is, has a tendency to sympathize with this man. At the same time, on the other hand, he also criticizes the man or he stands in judgment. So this, according to Robert Langbaum, is what makes Robert Browning's um, uh, dramatic monologues more interesting. And I find that a very, uh, uh, kind of, a very revelatory kind of an observation because that is very true. Each time you read a monologue of um, Robert Browning, that is what you f you feel. You feel that uh, you really you, that you feel that you can really see what this man is seeing. You really understand what he's saying. But at the same time, you feel that this is not this is not what you are supposed to have done. So that is a special point, I guess you can add when you write an answer about dramatic monologue, especially in reference to uh, Robert Browning's monologues. And uh, so with this, I think uh, I have covered some all the important features of dramatic monologue. Now in the next video, I will be going on to the poem Andrea del Sarto, which is a classic example of Robert Browning's dramatic monologues.